Thank Nathan for that. Look like I want to turn this way. Okay, all right, that's more like it. I want to thank Brother Nathan Bachelor for that beautiful rendition. And I'm truly glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've lived in several countries. Um, Jamaica, that's where I'm from. I've lived in um, Bermuda. And I've lived in several states here in the U.S., Maryland, Georgia, now Tennessee. <coughs> and even one time I was also in Canada. <coughs> and everywhere I go, two things I always ask God <coughs> for. <coughs> Let's drink a little water for this. The Sabbath, which comes every week, and a church. If I have those two things, I'm okay. I'll be good. And so I'm truly glad I'm a part of the family of God, which is a bigger family, by the way. Now, before we go into the word, I'd like us to have a word of prayer. Let us pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we want to thank you again for another beautiful Sabbath day. And we truly thank you for uh, the family of God, where we can come and we can fellowship and we can worship you together. And as we come to look into your word, Lord, we pray, we pray that you may bless. May not your words return unto you void. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Okay, so <clears throat> the title of this sermon is From Eden to Eden. And what I'm going to talk to you about is what the world was like during Eden. What happened that caused us to lose that Eden experience? And how we're going to get back there, right? So that's what we're going to look at this morning. So let's begin by getting a picture of what, what the world was like as it comes from the Creator's hand. It says here in Patriarchs Prophet, and Prophets, page 42, it says, As the earth came forth from the hand of its maker, it was exceedingly beautiful. Catch that adjective there? Exceedingly beautiful. Its surface was diversified with mountains, hills, and plains, interspersed with noble rivers and lovely lakes. But the hills and mountains were not abrupt and rugged, abounding in terrific steeps and frightful chasm, as they now do. The sharp, rugged edges of the earth's rocky framework were buried beneath the fruitful soil which everywhere produced a luxuriant growth of verdure. There were no lords, some swamps, or barren deserts. Uh, graceful shrubs and delicate flowers greeted the eye at every turn. The heights were crowned with trees more majestic than any that now exist. The air, untainted by foul miasma, was clear and healthful, the entire landscape outvade in beauty and decorated grounds of the proudest invade in beauty than the most decorated grounds of the proudest palace. The angelic hosts view the scene with delight and rejoice at the wonderful works of God. God placed Adam and Eve in a garden. This was their dwelling place. Uh, the blue heavens were its dome. The earth was its delicate flowers and carpet of living green was its floor. And the leafy branches of the goodly trees were its canopy. Sounds beautiful, isn't it? Its walls were hung with the most magnificent adorning, the handiwork of the great master artist. In the surroundings of the Holy Pier was a lesson for all time that true happiness 
is found not in indulgence of pride and luxury, but in communion with God through his created works. In the beginning, when God created the heaven and the earth, he made sure he put everything, he put everything in place for our physical and our spiritual well-being. I'm sure you are familiar with the acronym New Start, right? Where new is for nutrition, E is for exercise and all that. Did you know that when God was creating the earth, he placed all those there? Uh, let me share some with you. Nutrition. <clears throat> In Genesis 1, 11 and 12, it says, And God says, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit a tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. And the, uh, the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and a tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Right? And if you look at what, God, what um, Adam had for a meal, it was... Um, it's found also in Genesis. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. <clears throat> so that was um, Adam's meal plan. So it was basically fruits, nuts, and grains. And after sin, God added vegetables. <clears throat> and you know how long Adam lived for? Adam lived 930 years, right? And it all dwindled down to Noah, who lived for 175 years. <clears throat> Not Noah, sorry. Abraham, who lived for 175 years. This, this meal plan was a significant factor in the longevity of the early race. And God said it was good, and indeed it was good. <clears throat> No enhancing drugs were used um, like they advertise today um, to, 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 to boost longevity. You'll notice that there were no cheese, no chips, no Pringles, no Cheetos, no Cool Ranch, no Doritos, nothing like that. It's amazing when you go into the supermarket, the, the store, there's a whole aisle of stuff that goes crunch. But God has given us a simple meal plan to follow, and that can give us longevity. Then there's exercise. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in a garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. So even in a sinful world, exercise was still good, right? <clears throat> he placed exercise in our work. And after sin, God said, by the sweat of your brow, you shall eat bread. Many see that as a curse, but indeed it was a blessing because he placed the exercise in the work. So we no longer eat by the sweat of our brow. We eat now by the click of a mouse. Right? And so we have to go to the gym or we go walking or jogging or whatever to keep that um, going. <clears throat> and especially with the advent of electricity, um, we kind of deprive ourselves of sleep. We're up all uh, um, uh, uh, hours of the night. And technology has slowed our motions. You know, this, that's what technology does. It, 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 it gives you less to do, right? <clears throat> right? Um, I'm in my house. I want to talk to my wife. She's somewhere beyond my voice. I call her on the phone, <laughs> right? <clears throat> social media makes us antisocial. I remember the days when I was growing up. Our parents used to have trouble getting us to stay in the house. Today... They have trouble getting us out the house, even out of our rooms. And that's what technology does. So exercise, God placed exercise there for us. And now we used to walk everywhere we go. Today we have cars, nice ones, some not so nice. And we drive everywhere we go now. So God placed exercise there, which was for our good. Water and fresh air. Then God says, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament, the firmament which is actually the atmosphere, <clears throat> and he divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. 
In comparison to food and water and air, <coughs> you'll notice that food, how long can we live without food? They have a, a three principle, like three weeks, generally speaking, you can probably go without food. Water, they say generally about three days. And air, don't try it no longer than three minutes, right? So if you notice uh, these things, these are, are, are very important things for our well-being. But God is so good. Check this. The most important, the most expensive of the three is what? Food, right? Yeah, food is the most expensive um, when you go to the store. And then comes, uh, but that, that's the one that we can live the longest without, right? And then after food, you get what? Water is a little less expensive than food. That's a, the second one we can live the longest without. Now, fresh air, what is that? That's free. And that's the one we can actually, we can't live without. More than three minutes, right? So God made that free. I'm glad that God did, um, um, God, God did not allow men to put a price on that one, right? Many of us wouldn't be alive today, right? And so God placed all these things in the beginning for our best benefit. And talk about sunlight. We're going through new, new, the new start acronym now. Sunlight. Then God says, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to defy the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. And of course, we know the importance of the sun, right? The sun not only gives us light, but it also gives us a vitamin. What's that vitamin called? Vitamin D. And especially those of us who are of the darker skin, it's natural for us to lack vitamin C because our skin doesn't absorb it as much, right? The first time I went to the doctor to, to do a vitamin D test, he told me it's the worst he ever recorded. He had to put me on a, on a very strong one. And then after that, I never leave vitamin D. And even the sun, uh, it's, 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 I have more appreciation for the sun these days because of this vitamin D. And the sun also keeps us warm. Without the sun, now we have gone through the winter in this tent, right? So we can see the difference that the sun makes as the earth turns through um, the different seasons of the year. Right, keeps us warm. And also another thing that the sun um, is good for, sunlight is good for, is good for your mood. Right? When it's nice and shiny, sunny, you're, it makes you more, a little more upbeat and more happy. When, when it's like gloomy and, and dark all the time, it makes you miserable and grumpy, right? So God gives us the sunlight for benefit. And then there is temperance, right? And it says in Genesis 2, then the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So here is temperance. Temperance is um, the moderate use of the good things and abstaining from that which is bad. And so God is given uh, Adam and Eve here the, 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 the ability or the exercise to, to, to the, the ability and the choice to exercise temperance in this regard, right? And then you have rest. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done and he rested on the seventh day. And then there we have the Sabbath day rest. And rest we know is very important, right? Very, very important. But this is another thing I want to say about rest. <coughs> In order for you to repair your car, you have to park it, right? Obviously. If you want to go to the doctor to get a medical tune-up, you have to stop work. You have to take time out from work and go to the doctor. And then you have to fulfill the doctor's appointment. It's the same way with the Sabbath that um, we have to fulfill the doctor's appointment, which is God our Father, right? And if you notice, Jesus did many, many healing miracles on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a day of rejuvenation, refreshing, right? And I hear someone mention that there are other types of rest too that we take. We might not notice them, but they are there, 
For example, you have the, the minutely rest. You know, when you're working and you say you take a five, you take a five-minute break, that's a minutely rest. And then you have the, the, uh, the, 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 the hourly rest, where you take a lunch break. You're working through the day, you take a break to have your lunch. And then you have the daily rest, that's when you sleep at night. You have the weekly rest, which is the Sabbath. You have the monthly rest. We get that every so often in the form of um, um, holidays. And then you have the yearly rest. We call it vacation. And then the final rest will be the eternal rest when Jesus comes back. Amen? Can't wait for that one. Then there's one more piece to this new start thing. That this is where the problem lies. This is what cause the trouble, and that is trusting God. Now, there are many advertisements on TV and radio and internet about all these magic drug or all these miracle plant that can give you longevity, but it's not connected to a trust in God, right? Trust in God and your longevity goes hand in hand, and as we, as we as we will see that this is what caused man to start dying because of this trusting God peace that was missing, <coughs> right? Um, there was a time, there was a plant, guinea hen weed. Have you ever heard of that? There's a guinea hen weed. There was a craze about that. And we have it growing wild in Jamaica. And... When it came out that this was a real miracle um, bush, it could do so much things. It can, it can, um, <clears throat> it's good for arthritis, for digestive disorder, they say, infections, diabetes, cancer. It's also a pain relief. When that news landed in Jamaica, there was no more wild guinea hen growing nowhere, anywhere around. It becomes like gold. But still, it was not connected to trust in God. And so trust, this trust in God piece is very crucial to our well-being. God put them all there during the time of, of, of creation, right? And this is where Adam and Eve um, fell short. <clears throat> and this is how it, it happens now. We're going to go to... <clears throat> Let me find my place right here. Trust in God. Okay. <clears throat> Trust in God is not and cannot be manufactured by man. It was God who placed it there. Everyone who was made with the capacity to serve God, right? There's a God-sized hole in everyone. We are all made to worship. If we do not worship God, we will worship something. <clears throat> Because why? We are made in the image of God. We'll never be satisfied, we'll never be fulfilled until we fully accept and worship him. <clears throat> Remember the woman at the well who came to get water? But when she met Jesus, who gave her the living water instead, she ran and she left her water pots because she found a water that was inside of her springing up into everlasting life. And she went and told those of the Samaritans, come see a man, right? And the Samaritans came out, and because of this woman's testimony, they too come and worship, um, worship uh, God. <coughs> we are no different. We too have pursued failure, courted defeat, and end up marrying to destruction. Always going about seeking for a winning formula, not knowing that all we need, all that is missing, is trust in God. Our situation may be the same as the woman at the well. Like her, without God, we will seek to fulfill this vacuum with something that will keep us chasing the wind. God is the one who, who took the initiative to connect with us by putting a little of himself in us. He made us in his image. And so in our seeking and our searching, God is the only one who can fulfill that void. <clears throat> and we are very valuable to God, right? <clears throat> and the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life. And man became a living being. <clears throat> what we are made of? 
Dust. That's what we are made of, dust. I heard a preacher bring out this illustration. I'd just like to share it with you. I think it was um, Randy Skeet. He shared this text in Genesis that says, Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there parted and become four river heads. The name of the first was Pishon. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Right? So, obviously there was gold available to God. Right? But yet, what did God made us from? He made us from dust. Right? Some may not act like it, but each of us and everyone is made from dust. No one has God made from gold. You have rich dust, you have poor dust, you have educated dust, uneducated dust, but we are all dust. No one that I know is made from gold. But watch this. Because we are made in the image of God, we are worth far more than gold. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. We are worth far more than gold. It says, who being in the form of God, how do I know this? Who being in the form of God did not consider himself robbery to be equal with God, but make himself of no reputation. Who is this talking about? Jesus taking on the form of our bond servant and coming in the likeness of, of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and become obedient to the point of death. And that's what Jesus becomes like one of us. And that elevated the race. Not only that, we are made in his image, but Jesus stepped down and become like one of us and died the death of the cross. He paid a price that is far more valuable than any gold this world can offer, right? Jesus' sacrifices was free, but it was not cheap. How does this increase our value? But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, and to them that believe on his name, right? And so God, because of Jesus Christ, we are worth far more than gold, <clears throat> Because of sin, the image of God in us has become marred. But if we accept Jesus, we can again regain that image. When we get to heaven, we'll be walking on gold. And this signifies the fact that we are much more valid than it. Amen? Now we are going to look at the account in Genesis and how our first parents lost all the good things created for our well-being and especially this trust in God, right? So we see there how God provided everything for our well-being. Everything was in place. It was a beautiful world, but we lost it. It says here in Genesis 3, 1 to 3, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, had God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden, and the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which in the midst of the garden God had said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now listen. I want you to notice what's happening here. The serpent used uh, a few little tricks. Uh, one of the first things he used is what I want to call the pendulum effect. Right? The pendulum effect where he, he said to the woman, as God said, you shall not eat of any tree. Did God say that? No, God did not say that. What he, do, what, what he did, he took away from what God said, right? And he took it to this way extreme over here, right? And then it is so effective that it caused Eve to go as a pendulum swing to the other opposite end of that argument by adding to what God says. And she add the words, you shall not touch it, even though God did not say that, right? Now, did Eve know the truth? Yes, she did. But this was a wily fellow, right? So he used a pendulum effect. And today, that same effect is, is being used, right? And so we're, 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 we're having in our world today these far extremes. And each one feeds off the other. And... And one can't survive without the other because one agitate the other. And so they move from this side to that side, right? And so that's, that's where it started. The devil used that, what we call that pendulum effect. And the scripture warns about adding or taking away from God's words, right? It says, if we had, it, he will add to our plagues. And if we take away, he'll take away our name out of the book of life. So we don't want to be caught 
doing that are being a part of these extremes situation. Right? The serpent also tried to cloud in mystery with that which was clear. Now, can it get any clearer than that? <laughs> that you shall eat of all the trees, but not this one. The devil make it seem as if God meant, meant something else. And today we have even movements that are clouding in mystery, the plainest portions of scripture. Things that God said clearly to us and the devil is trying to give it another meaning. That was one of the devil, um, the devil um, 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 tactics. I'm amazed at some of the conclusion that we come to in our world today. When the scripture is clear on that. Don't want to get into anything controversial, but for example, I'm a man. There was a time that was not debatable. You see what I'm saying? But this is just showing you how clear things can be shrouded in, in, in mystery and cause things not to be defined clearly as, as, uh, as they should. Right? The serpent also violated the principle of sowing and reaping, indicating that if you do wrong, you can get good rewards. This is where it started, right? And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You can do wrong, and nothing bad will happen to you, right? He's go as far as indicating that if you disobey God, you will be better off. Lies, Right? The Bible says, be not deceived, Galatians 6, 7, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that he shall also reap. And if we understand this simple principle, there's a lot of decision that we made that we would not make, if we understand this principle. I remember, I was, I think I was living in Bermuda at the time, and Someone was giving us a drive from, from, from a church, from a church service, an afternoon church service to home. But it was during the time of Halloween, right? And as he was driving, he, he, he heard some, some, something mushy hit on the car. And he came out and looked. Some boys were hiding up in some trees, throwing eggs, right? Throwing eggs at people's cars driving by, right? He came back in the car and he laughed. And my wife and myself was wondering, why is he laughing? He said, you know what? When I was a boy, this same spot, I used to hide and throw eggs on people's cars. <laughs> right? Whatsoever you sow, that you shall also reap. Right? <clears throat> Just look around and we'll see today. Right? The pain, the suffering, the sexual misconduct, the mass murders, the diseases like COVID we are facing today, cancer, heart attack, stroke, all these just because somebody decided to disobey God. <clears throat> Disobedience to God, even in the minutest sense, can have grave consequences. And that's the point I want to drive home today. If we take heed to this one principle, our life can be so much different. Um, in Ecclesiastes, it says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. And so because God does not execute ju judgment like immediately, men just continue to do wrong. <clears throat> and so they eat the fruit. And when, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took off the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. <clears throat> this early account confirms the inseparable connection between the physical and the spiritual. Though appetite or eating is a physical act, it had spiritual implications. Why? Once God is involved, you can separate the spiritual element. The Bible says, whether therefore you eat or you drink or whatsoever you do, do all to what? To the glory of God. Interestingly, 
this is not the only place where we see appetite used as a test. Right? In Daniel, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not, what? He would not eat the king's food. It's important to note that when Daniel went to Babylon, they changed his name, they changed his education, but when it came to his food, he says, Oops, hold on a minute, not so fast, right? You're not going to change my food. And because Daniel stood up to that fact that he decided he wasn't going to eat the, 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 the king's meat, look at the results. The Bible says that they were ten times better than their contemporaries. You know how much is ten times? This is not 100%. 100% is two times. This is ten times. Whenever anything happened, ten times better than the previous thing in, um, in the technological world, they call that an order of magnitude, right? And an order of magnitude usually causes a disruption. That's why we have smartphones now. Because when the, when the, um, what's it, the iPhone came out, it was as it were, 10 times or an order of magnitude better than, than the one it was before. Now, if this diet and if appetite can do this, sign me up. Amen? Amen. Sign me up. And listen, <clears throat> if there was no victory in Daniel chapter 1, there would be no Daniel chapter 2, no Daniel chapter 3, no Daniel chapter 4, and so on and so forth. Those three Hebrew boys who stood boldly, in the face of Nebuchadnezzar, with that fiery furnace as a consequence, they first had to overcome appetite. Right? Daniel's in the lion then is the same thing. I don't know about you, but appetite, I think, is a very important part of this reaping and sowing thing. <clears throat> and also Jesus, in the beginning of his earthly ministry, we see it keep happening time and time again. I'm just um, giving you a few examples here. After fasting for 40 days, what was the first thing he was tempted to do? He was tempted to turn stone into bread. There we go, appetite again. There's got to be something to overcome this appetite business. Jesus was hungry, yet he did not fail. Adam and Eve was not hungry. He passed the test on the very point that they failed at. And that's why we got hope. Amen? What is like... <clears throat> What is like you to know that um, Jesus overcome this test of appetite before embarking upon his earthly ministry? If Jesus and others face overcoming appetite as a precursor to their mission, the success of their mission, don't you think that there is some importance to it? Don't you think so? They say that, we don't know who they are, but they say that if you overcome appetite, chances are you can overcome other things, right? A man will kill for food faster than he will kill for anything else. <clears throat> so if this works for Daniel and his friends and for Jesus, what do you say? How about me? Amen? Now, what was the first thing they noticed after eating the fruit? They were naked, right? Do you think physical nakedness is an indication of spiritual of a spiritual lack? In Laodicea, um, the church of Laodicea, Romans 3.17, not Romans, Revelation 3.17 says, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and what? And naked. Right? So we see nakedness is associated with spiritual lacking, right? <coughs> Now, after almost 6,000 years, do you see how we cannot recognize our nakedness? Adam and Eve, at least, they recognized that they were naked. But when it comes to Laodicea, they did not know that they were, they were naked. We serve a great God. Just as he did not leave them to their own demise, he's reaching out to us today to save us. He says in Revelation chapter 3, I stand at the door and knock. And Jesus is knocking at each of our hearts' door today because he wants to cover our nakedness. After realizing the, their nakedness, what did they do? 
they sowed fig leaves, right? <coughs> they sowed fig leaves to cover their nakedness. <coughs> Now, they were, even though the Bible says that they were naked, it, it actually means they did not have any artificial clothing. That doesn't mean they were bare naked. Let me, let me just prove that with two um, quotations here. Um, in this book, Patriots and Prophets, it says, The sinless spear wore no artificial garments. They were clothed with a covering of light and glory, such as the angels wear. So, so long as they live in obedience to God, this robe of light continued to enthrone them. Now, how does the scripture back this up? In Psalms 104, verses 1 to 2, it says, Blessed, uh, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. O coverest thyself with light as with a garment who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain. And so we are made in God's image. So it's not far-fetched to think that just as God covered himself in, with light, so was the, um, Adam and Eve also covered with light. So as soon as they sinned, the light departed. That's how they knew they were naked. It's clear to me that nakedness physically indicates that something is wrong. So... Um, so physical nakedness and spiritual nakedness are like go hand in hand. Um, listen to the story of this demon-possessed man. It says, And they arrive at the country of the Gardenese, Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to land there, met him with, out of the city a certain man which, have, which had devils a long time, and where he wear no clothes. Neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. This was a, this was a, a, um, a, a crazy guy. He wore no clothes. He was naked. But listen to what happened to him after he met Jesus. Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. Amen. So we want to be clothed and in our right minds. Isn't that wonderful? And so Jesus clothed Adam and Eve. He gave them coats of skin to cover their nakedness, their physical nakedness and their spiritual nakedness. <clears throat> it's impossible to become righteous by mere human effort. And so with Adam using fig leaves to cover himself, what he was attempting to do was trying to cover his own, um, 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 his own nakedness, and that indicates self-righteousness. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. And so Jesus is the one that clothes us with his righteousness so that we can produce good works. It's not something that we can do of ourselves. And that's what Adam was trying to do when he tried to cover himself in, in, in fig leaves. And so when Jesus came into the garden, Jesus did something that was quite interesting. We know that God knows everything, right? And so when Jesus came into the garden, what did he say? He says, Adam, Adam, where are you? Now, didn't Jesus know what took place? But this is what I like about Jesus. In our court system, they have a thing where they say, you're innocent until proven guilty, right? Jesus is a just God. And everyone is given opportunity to speak for themselves, right? He gives everyone an opportunity. So he was giving Adam an opportunity to speak, to please case. And not because you disagree with someone, you should shut them down or cut them off. Always give a listening ear, even if you don't agree with an individual. And so Jesus gave Adam and Eve an opportunity to express themselves. God always investigates before he brings forth judgment. And that's what I like about the God that we serve because there gives room for mercy and for grace. 
The beautiful Eden home was lost. God drove them out and guarded the gate so that they could not enter. Their hidden home was lost. If we throw a stone in a pond, what it will create? It will create ripples, right? And those ripples will go far be beyond the point of impact. The act of eating the forbidden fruit seems very simple, but the results were far-reaching. From eating a fruit to murder, where Cain killed his brother Abel, it got so bad in the space of a few thousand years that God had to destroy the entire world with a flood, saving Noah and his family. The Bible says that the intention of their hearts was what? Only evil continually. And even after God did that, cleansed the earth with flood, we still continue to see the effects of sin, natural and man-made. In recent times, we see flooding and landslides and volcanic activities. As a matter of fact, there's a volcano erupting um, in St. Vincent um, recently that hasn't been erupted for years. And I think some other places as well. We see these things happen, wildfires in multiple countries, because COVID is the main topic. A lot of these things are unheard of, like they are suppressed, or we're not listening for these things. Complex humanitarian emergencies, civil unrest, worldwide coronavirus, which we are facing now. Jesus himself predicted wars and rumors of wars, distress of nation, calamities by land and by sea, and men's hearts failing them for fear. A time of trouble, he says, is coming that this world I've never seen, not up until that time. 2020 serves as a vivid reminder in our lifetime of the reality that we experience by someone going against what God says, by losing that one piece of this whole health issue of not trusting in God. And no one knows what the end of 2021 will bring. There are all type of scenarios going out of what will happen. And we know, because we are Bible students, we know that it's going to get worse before it gets better. But trust in God. That peace is what we need. If we have that, we can face anything. Amen? But all is not lost. I say all is not lost. Amen? The first Eden was lost. But the Eden will be restored. This time, it will be different. The Bible says that sin will not raise its ugly head a second time. The mistakes from the first Eden will not be repeated. Right? For that, I said, praise the Lord. Who want to go back through this again? Anyone? Not me. It says here in Revelation 21, 1 and 2, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I can't wait. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. This experience is going to be out of this world. Can you imagine a world like that? No death, no sorrow, no crying. Who among us haven't had a good night, um, uh, a good night crying because of the things that we go through? All of that will be gone. And this will go on forever and forever and forever. Let me share with you something interesting about this new Eden that will be restored. And I can't wait to see this one. Listen. Revelation 21 verse 5, it says, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write for these things are true and faithful. Did you catch it? Let me read it again. It says, Behold, I make all things new. What behold mean? It means to look. When God was creating the earth, there was no one there to experience it other than the angels. Adam did not even get the chance to see God made Eve because he was asleep, right? Object lesson there. Let God choose your spouse. Amen. 
I'm nothing to do with it. Another object lesson. Even if God chose your spouse, you still might have issues. Amen? So let God... So nobody was there to, 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 to experience God create the earth, right? But the Bible says, Behold, I make all things new. In other words, we are going to watch as God recreate the earth. Amen? Amen? The earth will be destroyed by fire when sin and sinners, root and branch, are destroyed. God is going to say, let there be trees. Let there be um, fish. What I pet you like? Dog, let there be dogs. Let there be this. Let there be that. Hollywood have no special effects that can match that. That's better than watching television. Amen? And I can't wait to experience that. And like Job says, to see with my own eyes. <clears throat> I will be a front seat spectator for that one. Right? Let there be trees. Imagine that. Let there be a... Or you see God speak and things happen. The question is now, how do we get from that Eden to this Eden coming? I'm going to read Revelation 14, 5 to 7. This is the first angel's message, but I'm going to start a verse earlier, right? I'm starting at verse 5. It says, And in their mouth was found no guile, which means that just as how Adam and Eve was perfect, we are going to get back to that state again, back to the image of God. Amen? Amen. But before no mouth was, um, no, no guile was found in their mouth, it says, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. We are, we are in a similar situation like Adam and Eve. Just to keep it simple, there are only two voices to obey. The voice of God, the serpent is still speaking. Right? The serpent is still speaking. It's not no one forbidden fruit this time. It's many things. There's every wind of doctrine blowing out there. Can't believe everything you see on the internet. Everything we believe must come from the word of God. Amen? That's where our trust in God, in God have its foundation. <clears throat> we have seen the results of the seed of sin. We have seen, um, we, we have reaped the effects of sin. We no more want to believe the devil's lie that you can disobey God and be better off. You can disobey God and nothing bad will happen. Just as God came down in the garden to investigate, right? God is in the process now of investigating. How shall you stand? How shall I stand? In this antitypical day of atonement, back in among the Hebrews, they had a day they call the day of atonement, which typifies what we are going through today. And during that period of time, people would spend time making wrongs right. Is there anyone you haven't spoken to for a long time? Any family member you don't speak to? The Bible says that if someone comes to worship God and you remember that your brother have art against you, what should you do? Leave your gift there. As a matter of fact, one preacher said, leave it in case you don't come back. Leave your gift there. Go make it right and come back to God, right? Make one's right. Clear up all the differences. COVID, I believe, give us a grand opportunity to do just that. We are always busy. Hustling and bustling going everywhere. Everything shuts down. Give us all the time in the world to do self-searching. To, 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 to make it right with God. Husband and wife, um, it's ironic. Um, I mean, husband and wife were together during the COVID and they, you have domestic problems. That shouldn't be the case, right? But we want to make wrongs right between husbands and wife, between parents and children, right? This is the time to do that. God is investigating. Like Adam, he's saying, where are you? Where are you in your relationship to me? I'm about to restore Eden. This time, the same things are not going to happen again. Sin will be forever gone. Right? You will live forever in peace, in, in, in um, no pain, no sorrow. Isn't that what we want? 
it's time to make it right with our God. Wherefore, um, Hebrews 12, 1 says, Wherefore, in seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience. Running with patience is not a sprint. It's a marathon. Let's run with patience this race that is set before us. And you notice here it used the word weight. Let us set aside every weight. There are some things that are not necessarily sin. But they are weight. There might be nothing wrong with this or nothing wrong with that. But they'll hold you back. You got to let it go. If it's going to come between you and your God. Amen. <clears throat> it is not just one forbidden fruit this time. It is many. And by the power of God, we can overcome. He's calling us back to true worship. He's calling us to fear God and to give glory to him. Meaning, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. How we decide to live our life will determine who we obey and will also determine our entry into the new Eden. He that overcome, Revelation 21 says, 21 7 says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. <clears throat> God told Adam that he would die when he eat the fruit, right? Did God mean what he said? Of course he did. Did Adam die that day? I hear all kind of explanations for this. People explain that he started to die or whatever, whatever. But this is my conclusion. <clears throat> Adam was covered with the coats of skin. Where did that skin come from? Come from an animal. What had to happen to the animal for you to get his skin? He had to die. So death did occur that day. But guess what? That death wasn't Adam. That is called grace. That is called mercy. That is the lamb slain. That is a representative of the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Like we were discussing in our Sabbath school. Jesus had to have this problem before sin comes in. If he had waited until Adam sin, it would be too late. Adam would be a dead man. So this animal that was killed shouldn't die. It should have been Adam. Abraham knows very well about this. When he was asked to sacrifice his son, right? He said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And with Adam, as it is with us, God did provide a sacrifice. Imagine God. Imagine Jesus saying to Adam, the day you eat, you shall surely die. Actually, what Jesus was saying, the day you eat, I am going to die. Can you imagine that? Jesus saw his own death. If Adam ate that fruit, and that is what I call love. <clears throat> right there in Genesis, hope was given. It says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise it he its heel. And that happened at the cross. And the Bible says, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, anybody who believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we'll no longer be perishable items if we believe in Christ. Amen? Think about this. When Jesus, <coughs> oh, I said that already. I'm going ahead of myself. So God extended mercy and grace to Adam. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Grace is getting what we do not deserve. Today, if you hear my voice, the scripture is saying, harden not your heart. Choose you this day, life or death. What do you want? Everything was placed in Eden for our well-being. By the mercies of God, those things still exist, including trusting in God. But that one piece, people... Majority of the world shun. They want the rest to keep them healthy, but they don't want the trust in God part. Because the devil has told a lie. 
And if you don't trust in God, you can still be well. Lie. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. Judgment is not a bad thing. Judgment is a good thing. During the time of racial injustice, what sign you see they have up? We want justice. We naturally want justice. That's what this judgment is about, justice. God is going to bring true justice. But we have to, like the Bible says, believe on him, trust him, and we will not become perishable items. The divine in, in, intention of God is to restore what was lost. Restore his image back into man. Eden will be restored. The great controversy will be ended. I want to leave this quote with you. It's the last, uh, the last paragraph in the, last bo in the book of the great controversy. It says, the great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. Can you imagine that? One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him... Who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illum illuminatable space from the minutest atom to the greatest world all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy declare that God is love and with that I say amen let us pray Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. And as you, by your own life, had made yourself an atonement for us, help us, Lord, to live a life that is pleasing to you. As we leave this place, Lord, I pray that your words will not return unto you void, but you will accomplish, accomplish what it goes out to accomplish. Thank you again, Lord. Bless us as we go different ways, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen.